high. Looks like we're live. So this is gonna be another software kind of live coding work in progress, behind the scenes kind of stream. Honestly, a little bit of this is me procrastinating video editing, um, but uh, I think this project is pretty cool too. And um, I've been really into making some, some progress on this lately. So, um, and hi, nice to, nice to see folks. Nice to see you, Mad Bugger. Um, yeah, so here um, I am over here in WebAssembly land running a program that was originally written for DOS in the mid 80s. Um, and so this is a game, I, I've given kind of an introduction to what I'm trying to do in the last couple of streams. I, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time um, going into detail on that right now. Um, basically this is an old game called Robot Odyssey. You can find a lot of info on this online. Um, it was originally released for DOS and Apple II. Um, I was always into playing the DOS version as a kid because that's what we had. Um, so I'm kind of used to that. And this is my attempt at making a port slash revival slash enhancement of this game. And basically creating a way to play the game as you would have originally experienced it, just more conveniently in a browser. Um, but then I also would like to be able to add additional UI and help and potentially um, just convenience features and maybe additional graphics to the game. So more of like an HD remix or a 2018 remix. Um, Mad Beggar is wondering if it would be feasible to port ScumVM to WebAssembly. Um, I'd be surprised if that hasn't already been done. I, I'm pretty sure that is doable and in fact is probably just a matter of recompiling it because ScumVM um, and WebAssembly er, and, and Inscription both have SDL support. So yeah, I'm pretty sure that's already been done. And this is a similar idea, it's just that this game wasn't written in a VM so much as it was written in a bunch of hand-rolled assembly for the most part, so... <clears throat> anyway, I did some work off-stream on getting um, all of the multiple EXE files put together into one place. And actually, that's what you're seeing here, even though it starts up, um, so if I reload this web page. It goes directly into this part of the game, which is the innovation lab, as it says on the top. And I'm pretty happy with the load times and the file sizes so far. I got really worried because I was looking at this um, earlier and I had a five megabyte web assembly, but um, that was mostly debug symbols. I was like, why is this so huge? Oh, right. Um, and with a size optimized build, it's actually pretty close to the size of the original game. And if you compress it, it's actually significantly smaller than the original game was. So I'm pretty happy about that. No, I don't think two goes down here yet. It's kind of cold. Have the camera close by so we can see. <sighs> okay, so we've got this web assembly, and if you actually look at what's inside it, it mostly makes sense. Um, uh, just sorry, my fingers are cold. I should turn on the heater. Looks like the pilot light is out again. Uh, I don't feel like messing with the pilot light right now. All right, so we've got a bunch of strings. We've got a bunch of bits of data segment fluff. So like this is actually a bunch of the combined strings and data segment stuff from our C++ code. Um, elsewhere you'll see similar blobs of stuff um, related to the original game. So like, yeah, these strings are... I forget which of these are in the game's level files and which of them are in the EXEs. I think this is from the EXE. So 
So yeah, there's like some data that you would expect. Um, what is this stuff? I don't know what this stuff is. Anyway, let's look at this in an actual editor. So yeah, that was all the data fluff. I, I don't actually know what this giant blob is. Um, oh, that might be the game's cutscenes, actually. There's about 65 kilobytes of cutscenes, which might be this big string. Um, yeah, I think that was mostly file system-y stuff levels. So yeah, game data and WebAssembly seems like a fine format for all of this to end up in. Um, like some of these things that were separate files on floppy disk, I could actually like fetch them as separate HTTP resources, but I don't think that would actually be useful. I think that would just make distribution more annoying and I think it would make the game slower. Because there, none of the, none of those files are very big. So I think basically having a built-in file system that has all of the game's normal data and then like saved game files in your browser's local storage, I think that's the way to go. So yeah, and then once we get past the data and onto the code, this is all still code, or all still data rather. Um, oh, these are <laughs> these are strings that identify functions. That's part of my debug code, actually. That's kind of unnecessarily large. Um, anyway, the actual functions are in this extremely verbose format, but this is actually fairly high level compared to the original code. Um, it's got kind of block-oriented control flow, which mscripten has recovered from the original soup of go-tos and everything. So basically we start out with just bytes, and then my Python scripts do recursive descent disassembly in order to find functions and, um, you know, just like basic control flow. But then uh, the C++ code that it generates is still functions, but then inside each function is a C of go-tos. And so mscripten is actually responsible for converting those go-tos back into something else. So that's what we've got here. None of it is really that big. So I just added this system for registering multiple processes. Um, the process object is now much more lightweight. It's basically just register state and a V table. Like there's not much there. Um, and then this hardware object that they're all getting a pointer to, which is shared, that's got all the memory in it now. So I have 128K of RAM, and then frame buffers, whatever else I need for emulating hardware can be in here and shared between the processes. And then it also maintains a table of which processes are registered so that it can implement exec, since hardware is also responsible for the little tiny bit of emulated DOS and BIOS that I have. Um, so that's what I've been doing so far. So lab with an argument of 30. I just debugged this problem where I, I, ran, I ran lab 30. It just exited, nothing else. Um, and then I, I run game and it kind of works, but the graphics are all corrupted. And then I discover that it's because um, the way I reorganize this, I didn't want to clear all of memory in between loading processes because I'm trying to get the main menu working and the main menu works by having one shell process that loads other processes. And this is DOS, so it's all super low level and the OS doesn't really do much in the way of memory management. So it's kind of relying on the shell process being small and relocated into an area of memory that the other processes aren't using, as far as I can tell. Um, but for that to work, I have to not clear all of memory between like at inside hardware exec. So I changed that to clear memory once and then not. But uh, yeah, apparently I need to zero out some portions of the data segment that were not getting zeroed out then. So I was getting some like garbage on the screen. Um, I think actually the garbage was bits of the sprite data 
that ended up getting RLE compressed, um, any zeros that just happened to be in there would, would be removed and not written. And then so if that memory didn't get zeroed beforehand, I RLE decompressed the data segment. And then anything that would be runs of zeros in the sprite data gets replaced with garbage, which looked kind of interesting. Um, so I can jump directly into lab. I think I can jump directly into game also. Um, unfortunately, I still have to recompile it when I change this code. So um, it is already recompiling in the background here. <laughs> the real entry point is play.exe, which is kind of a menu shell that runs everything else. Um, and it's a good portion of the way toward working. It doesn't quite work yet, but... Um, Uh-oh, and then because of the reloader... Sorry about that. I've got multiple copies of the game running. Okay. So this is the actual game exe. Seems fine. No more graphics corruption. I can turn the robots on and off. The page reloads pretty quickly. It's pretty handy being able to use like web development tools on this on this app. It doesn't seem like Chrome provides that much visibility into the WebAssembly stuff yet. Firefox is a little bit better, but it's still kind of new territory for browser debugging. Oh, that's pretty cool. So you can see here, this is where we're going from the timer in the browser into the WebAssembly, and then we're running WebAssembly code for a while and then calling back into JavaScript to do a put image data. Um, anyway, so this kind of works. You can kind of play it. Um, it crashes when you get to the end of the level because I didn't have um, like exiting back to play.exe working. Um, I think right now the most severe problem is the modal dialog box experience. Um, I'm trying to make sure that I, I take like all the problems that could just potentially completely wreck the way I'm implementing this, like and cause me to start over, and trying to get those sorted out. So like for example this. Um, if I can't get the modal dialog boxes in this game working, I might have to do something a little bit more severe as far as how I translate and emulate control flow. Um, right now, a lot of these problems are coming from the fact that the control flow in the translated WebAssembly is a one-to-one -one exact match of the control flow in the original game. And anywhere I don't want that, I have to actually patch the game. Um, and so what you're seeing here is actually... Uh, the game runs once, by uh, I call into main, and then it gets to the end of the main loop after drawing the first frame to the screen, and then I actually exit, I kind of throw an exception right there, and um, continue at a callback function, which is actually, in this case, the next iteration of the main loop. So the way the code is translated, I actually end up with a main function that has the setup plus one iteration of everyone's main loop, and then I have separate functions that are just an additional main loop iteration. Um, so that all is working. Um, the place where it breaks is if I press escape right now, it's supposed to pop up a modal menu. If I do it, it just, it just hangs. Um, if I were to plan ahead and have the JavaScript debugger open when I do that, so right now I've just completely crashed this tab. I need to kill it and get a new tab. If I plan ahead and open open the debugger, and I go in here, press escape. Now I go in here and pause the script. Now you can see it's actually already sent me a new frame with this menu, and it's just waiting for keyboard input. So I need to figure out if it's possible to actually chop up this loop into that continuation style. Because um, if not, I'm going to have to 
maybe go back to the drawing board a little bit. Other than that, things are all right. I, I've got some compromises in the main menu that seem to be working where, um, let's see, there were a few things that cause it to just burn CPU otherwise. So it has some busy loops where it'll just keep checking the time and then use that to delay for a few seconds. Um, so I replaced those with callbacks and that seems to be fine. Um, it's got this thing that it does where it basically just draws the screen in a carefully chosen order and uses that as, um, as like a transition effect. So it has this really fancy like iris out that it does um, for drawing images. Um, and that doesn't have any delays. It's just implemented by carefully writing the loops to draw the screen in a particular order. So stuff like that is, um, like you don't usually see that handled very well by, with emulators because some of the, like for the normal game, you actually want to just run the code pretty quickly and then pause, I think, between frames. But the way that the original game did that was a little bit ad hoc. It just did that by having a very slow copy function that was called at the end of each frame, which kind of had the same effect. But um, these animations don't have that copy. They're not double buffered. You're writing directly to the video memory, but that write is slow enough that the code kind of forms this transition effect with the order that it draws in. So the way I'm gonna have to do that, um, or the way I am doing that really is, um, I have these traces that are inserted during code translation. Um, so I, I get the chance to, to add a little bit of C++ code anytime there's a memory write to the video memory segment. And when that happens, um, I, I think I'm just taking like every nth write, like every 50th write to video memory, I'll just treat that as a frame. But because I can't actually pause control flow right there and then break back out to uh, like ideally I'd be able to just you know put a pin in the program right there save the entire state then return after some time has passed after I've drawn another frame to the screen but I can't do that because I haven't virtualized control flow so um, like I can the, the thing that I'm doing right now involves like literally splitting the other code into another function kind of just like you would do by just ending the function and adding a new one I'm just like editing the machine code um, like assembling new instructions into the program as I'm translating it. So the problem is that only really works if you can treat that new entry point as like a main. You can't just like jump into the middle of a function that way. So um, there were some cases that were almost a problem. Like there, um, there was this keyboard input function in the main menu but it was just possible to effectively inline everything. So there was like a function that would have, would have gotten in the way of um, just like jumping right back into the continuation point. But um, yeah, that function was only called once so I could replace the call with a jump. And anyway, so I think the next step, there, there are some different directions we could go in. Like we could try to actually finish that uh, kind of animation queuing so right now I've got this thing where every nth write to the frame buffer, it kind of reports that there's a new frame there, but we only actually see the last one because we are running that sequence of code really quickly and then only pausing once we wait for input or once we hit one of those long delays. So I think instead what I want to do is run that code really quickly but queue up those frames and then play back the frames at the right time. There are a lot of ways we could do that. Um, my inclination is to queue them before converting from CGA to RGBA, just since that'll use a lot less memory. Um, so I might try to queue them uh, in some other data structure, which is outside the game's visible DOS memory, but is inside the WebAssembly module, and then queue them up there, and then have something that just converts those to individual um, like canvas frames when you call. So. Yeah, actually, now that I'm describing this, um, the rubber duck debugging is actually helping because I was expecting that this was going to require passing some complex data types between the JavaScripts and the WebAssembly code. But now that I'm thinking about this more, I think I can just do all the queuing on the WebAssembly side. And the JavaScript entry points could still be pretty simple, like basically just run until you have a frame. And then it'll internally run the emulation if the frame queue is empty or if the frame queue has some stuff in it, it'll just return or, you know, do the next queued frame and then return something indicating like how much to delay until the next call, basically. I think that's, 
Man, now that I'm describing it, I think I can even implement that entirely just using the mscript and APIs without even writing any new JavaScript. So, I don't know. Um, we'll get there later. I, I think the modals are the highest priority thing because I just need to know if I have to replace that entirely or not. So, I have a trace feature which lets me figure out where this is stuck in the original code. Let's turn that on. Also, after looking at that WebAssembly, I'm getting really annoyed by just how big those strings were. Let's do a minor optimization while we're here. So yeah, all of these strings are kind of repetitive. I don't think that's necessary at all. Um, I'm going to ignore the segment and just treat these all as near addresses. Because for debugging, that's sufficient. should be much smaller. Let's just call this function. Let's just flip this flag. I made this compile time flag for some reason. Okay, we should have an extremely spammy console now. Yeah. Oh, geez. Some of those tag mismatch messages are using the wrong printf specifier. Okay, well anyway, so I haven't actually tracked down what those mismatches are, 
I think they might be some weird code, like some mutually recursive functions or something that end up doing something weird with the stack. I don't remember what's actually going on there. Um, it's quite possibly a bug, but I'm going to look at it later. Oh, and this is just overwhelming my console now. Okay, so that's a bit better. So we're seeing functions that we're entering and exiting. This is going to be really slow. Anyway, press escape. Okay, so the messages are still coming out. I think this is a loop we're in. Let's try pausing it. Oh, I should have had this page open. Just even opening the debugger page is super slow. Mm. Okay, we might have to change this and be quicker about it. Let's get a new browser I think we're in the loop let's try to make sure yes yeah we're debugger paused So now it'd be great if we could figure out where we are. I mean, honestly, a full backtrace from the current location would be more useful than, um, than this list, because this doesn't really tell us where the loop is sitting inside of. Is this the repetition? So we got 13.6b, 13.5e, 3bfa, Yeah, let's just see if we can find this sequence, because I think that's what we're looking for. Um, I can't really get a backtrace from where I'm sitting here. If I, if I rebuild this with WASM symbols, then this might actually tell me which functions I'm in. But let's just go to the disassembler for now. Um, oh, what game binary are we in? Actually, I should be running this experiment on one of the binaries that I have a little more reverse engineering notes on. Because um, the main game I actually don't have much of an IDB for at the moment. Um, the tutorial I've done the most reversing on, so let's actually recreate this on the tutorial. Which tutorial level should we go to? I don't know if I've been to level four. That's 24 on the command line.
assertion failed. Why is it running tutorial 30? Yeah, where would it have gotten that? Is it, did it just build an, or like an old version of this CPP file? I really don't like this build system. It's called parcel. It's way too magical. I need to get something else set up. Oh yeah, I guess I've got time for that. Concrete was wondering if I could say a few words about what the tool chain is that I'm using. Um, yeah, so just pretty briefly, the original game is written in um, just real mode 16-bit assembly. Um, and I'm disassembling it with NASM, the NetWide assembler. Um, that's under control of a Python script, so it's actually like interactive recursive descent assembly, disassembly. So I'm disassembling the individual sections with NASM, analyzing the disassembly interactively with Python. When I say interactively, I mean like I've written a program that interacts with NASM to do the disassembly, and then I interact with the process of writing those programs. Um, and then that turns into some C++ code, which I'm linking with some other C++ code into a WebAssembly using mscripten. And then I'm using Parcel, which is that build system I was just mentioning I don't like, to combine the WebAssembly and some JavaScript into some more JavaScript. Well, I'm not, I'm not actually combining anything with the WebAssembly, but this JavaScript and CSS here is pre-processed by the build system. Um, and it's a combination of the loader for the WebAssembly, which is what I meant, and a little bit of additional JavaScript that comes from down here um, in the source directory, which right now is just like keyboard. Um, that's really all it is. I'm, I'm gonna add some stuff for like, right now the graphics output is actually done by inline JavaScript in here. So the original game code ends up getting these little binary translated hooks put in it that call functions like output frame with a pointer to their frame buffer. And then this is some C code, which translates the frame buffer into the right format, and then passes it off to some JavaScript, which slices it out of the memory in the WebAssembly and then copies it into a canvas. Um, that's, that's pretty much all there is. It's just like a weird hodgepodge. Is this still running? Oh, it's just very slow, I think. Uh, is there a way to clear the console log? Because, uh, man, this, yeah, this, does this help? A little bit. I think it's, this just gets slow from accumulating so many messages. Oh, it also helps if my keyboard focus is in the game and not the URL bar. This is a good tutorial level. All right, um, so I wanna simulate just some kind of modal dialogue situation in this thing that I've fairly well reverse engineered. So now I'm going to press escape. We'll see this stop, and we should see a cycle show up over here, which may or may not be obvious. In fact, I'm gonna clear this so we're only seeing the cycle. So now I need to stop it. Okay, cool. And so if we stop it, we can actually see this menu, um, which the fact that we can see it means that we've actually gotten a call to output frame already. So we've, we've been sent the game's low level CGA frame buffer, copied it to RGBA using the current palette, and then copied it all the way out to the canvas. Um, I'm planning on changing that so we're doing queuing of the frames in the WebAssembly. And so in that future world, we wouldn't actually have this luxury, but it's kind of handy to do this particular debugging right now. All right, can we see the pattern now?
So we've got this little function, 40C9, that returns immediately, and then 135E, which does a bunch of stuff and then returns. And that seems to be the loop that we're in. Let's see if we can find either of those in the disassembly. And so these are now 16-bit offsets, so they should match the numbers we're seeing in IDA, which is the reason I'm using them. For pretty much every other purpose, they're useless. Um, so, 40C9. Yeah, key state update. Oh, is this one of the functions I modified? Because this isn't acting like it usually does. I think this might be patched. I know I've written patches for the input before, but I wouldn't expect to need one here. Because I'm just implementing the BIOS calls. Yeah, what's going on here? Oh, 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 never, never mind. I'm, I'm reading this upside down. This whole thing is inside of 40C9. Um, right, that makes much more sense. So really I'm looking for call sites of 40C9 and whether I can trim those. Yeah, key state update. Let's just refresh on what's actually in here. So joystick update, keyboard update. This game does actually have joystick support that we're completely ignoring. How does that work? Because that, that was the joy file that we kept seeing. Um, I vaguely remember there being a separate setup utility that writes that joy file. Um, I don't remember how that part works. So we were going through key state update too. There's also update key state and cursor. So maybe we found the difference is that this is for the main game and the other one is just for modals. So update key state and cursor, it looks like these are the six main loops in the tutorial the six tutorial levels. Right? Yeah, so this is like one kind of updating key state. We don't need to worry about breaking the control flow here because we're already breaking the control flow at the end of each main loop. So instead, I think we could call this um, key state update for modal if we wanted. special keys. Oh yeah, I've already taken a look at how some of these screens work. So these comments are things that I left in the past, like show one of the following text screens. To go back to the menu, press escape. To go back to the room you just left, press enter. So right, like this loop here is a problem. Um, so 
basically I would just need to know um, how I can safely exit this. So, like for example, if this whole thing is called from deep inside the game main loop in some, at some point, can I, at the point where I get this key state update, can I set the continuation callback to this point temporarily until we get the right key? So that effectively makes this the main loop, which is cool, that's kind of what we want. But we've also just completely forgotten about the state of the main loop previously. And so the question I would have to answer is, is it okay to forget about that state? Like, can I put the continuation here until we get the right key press, then just keep kind of walking through here, but then at some point we'll walk off the end of the stack and we'll return past the beginning of the stack, and then I'll actually need to treat that as another continuation point to point back at the main loop. So that's one theory for how we could do this. Where is this called? Um, handle special keys. Oh! This is literally what's looking for the question mark and the slash in the first place. I think this is called in the main loops. Yeah. So we would, for example, be, so like there would be a small difference if you, for example, press slash um, or press escape or whatever to go into one of those submenus. Then we exit the submenu. The proposal that I've got in my head that I'm trying to evaluate would effectively end up, as soon as this menu is done, jumping straight back to the beginning of the main loop and ignoring the rest of the single main loop iteration. And I think that's fine. It would be different from how the original game works in a very slight way, but I don't think it actually matters. And I think that would make it possible to just completely like, unwrap the loop here. So what do we need to actually identify? So handle special keys, we don't need to worry about the entry point. I think we can just, um, well, I don't know. Like I can patch all of the exit points. Oh, geez, this is the chip menu. Whoa, Easter egg? I forgot about this, really? Um, it looks like this is code to handle a special key. I have it labeled control E here, um, and Easter egg, and then it sets or unsets this cursor collision detect flag. Is this like a walkthrough obstacles mode? So I don't, I don't have control keys wired up right now. Let's try this on DOSBox. Um, So I'm looking at the tutorial. I'm assuming this might be in the other binaries as well, but just to be sure, um, or just to you know be consistent here, let's run the same same binary in the same mode. So tutorial 24. <laughs> you can see in DOSBox already. I have to turn the cycles way down, and the aspect ratio is wrong, but.
Okay, so I can't walk through these walls. Can I go somewhere with a internal wall? I haven't pressed the key yet. I'm just looking for a good test case. Here we go. Okay, I'm pressing control E. It didn't seem to do anything. Control shift E? No. Just E? No. I don't know what that's about. I guess you also have to have this um, byte set in joy file, which I don't think I would. Joy file byte 9 has to be 5e. Byte nine, that was nine decimal. Okay. Okay. Let's try that same thing again. Control E. Oh, yes! Oh, it's a cheat code. And it lets you walk through these exterior walls too. Oh, that's neat. I wonder what significance 5E, oh, that's a carrot. Huh. That's pretty cool. We just, I wonder if that's documented anywhere. Yeah, I think, I think we just rediscovered and undocumented Robot Odyssey cheat code. You have to hex edit the joystick data file to put this caret 5e in location nine, and then you can press control E to turn on or off a walkthrough walls mode. That does turn it on or off, right? Yeah, I just turned it back off. In case you wanted to know if you could walk through this text. This seems familiar. I probably found this before and then just forgot about it. Like, I mean, I obviously documented the code here. Um, and I'm probably, I'm, I'm sure I would have actually tried changing the joy file. I just, I guess I never wrote this down anywhere. That's fun. Um, okay, so the thing we're actually trying to do here is when you press escape, you get this menu. And from looking at the code, so this function gets called every main loop iteration just to check for these keys. And it's checking for a bunch of them. Um, and then they each, well, some of them have their own little modal loop things. So help, either question mark or slash, go here. That's where it shows um, like information about the chip, if you're holding a chip, I think. Or just current help. Here's the save game menu. Game, why is this a stub? 
Am I disassembling the patched binary? Oh, no, no, because the tutorial doesn't actually implement saving games, so they just removed that code. But if we were looking at this on the actual game, we would see like a game load save menu there too, which would have its own little loops that we would have to break. Um, I think we've got to do this at every key state update for modal call site. Um, thinking about control flow again because like the first time so before you press any of these keys we'll have a continuation callback set up to run the game's main loop once this code will end up being called from inside that callback um, and we can make it all the way up to the point where we're in one of these loops before it's a problem so let's say we stop right before or after or instead of this call function um, or call instruction before this function call. Um, so we could insert a continuation right here. But then eventually you'll press the right key and this will return. And because the continuation was just this function, this function temporarily becomes main. Um, when you return, it's like we return from run. Um, the way it's coded right now, um, that would just be kind of ignored, and the next time you call run, it would start from the same continuation. So we would effectively get stuck in the tail of this function. Um, and so one way to get around that is to translate, you know, to do it all in the patching stage and just patch something at the end of every way out of here. Um, we should actually look at the main game binary, because I feel like its menu loop is going to be more complicated. State update for modal. Yeah, let's find this function. I think this function is probably pretty easy to identify from this pattern here where we're looking for the help keys. Okay, so this is the main loop again. Well, the main function with several main loops in it. Some one of these will be, oh, this one. So this one is a good bit larger. So. Special keys, I think this is load and save. Quit with error code, this will go back and ask play.exe to run a different file. This is the save code, just like in line right there.
else calls this? Key state update for modal. What? This is just a little busy loop and then it moves on. So like code like this, I feel like I'm hoping this just gets removed entirely by the optimizer, but I should check. So this is handling like keyboard scan code stuff for um, detecting arrow keys. I think that's what those constants are. And it's just making the BIOS call, doing a little bit of keyboard translation, storing the result. Yeah. Oh man, so many call sites. I probably do need to just make a pattern that can search for call sites. Since we're coming up on this problem several times. Why in load world file? I think there are just a bunch of places where we could end up asking the user to switch floppy disks. Like this, insert disk one, modal dialog. So maybe we do take these on a case by case basis, I don't know. I mean, this function, I don't think I can find this with a pattern. This is different than I've seen in the other binaries. Hmm. File to delete. Oh, if there's a disk error during saving, then we delete the file and then, okay. Insert storage disk. Yeah, I, I can't just automatically find all these call sites. There's just so much going on here. Um, like these insert disk things, I think I should just patch around these. Um, I don't really need them. I don't really want them. I don't think it really adds to the experience to see a useless dialog that you have to press enter for. Um, I'm just trying to imagine how the continuation flow is going to work here. Um, so let's say I did put a let's say I did put a continuation here. Uh, where is this actually called? Oh, this is in handle special keys. Yeah, I mean, one way I could solve this is to find every call site, add the continuation automatically, but then, um, and then set something up so that when, like if I exit from the current continuation function without setting up a new continuation, then maybe there's like a default that it goes back to and that can be set up to the main loop. Um, I've been struggling with something similar for the processes. Like, do I want there to be a stack of processes? Do I want there to be just like a current one and a shell, like a two level stack? Um,
Yeah, I don't know. We could just have another list of call sites. Um, like, I don't know if it's easier to copy all the addresses out of Ida, but it has less chance of false positives than just doing kind of a haphazard scan. Yeah, maybe I want to think of it as a stack. It's just I don't want it to grow unbounded, which could happen pretty easily if I make a mistake and it's a stack. Let's see how many of these we have in the tutorial. Oh geez, only two of them in the tutorial. That's just the go back to the room or go back to the menu screen and then just right down here it is Why are these two different? Oh, this is continuing from here, so that's help or escape scene screen. This seems like it's basically just the same code as the game EXE, but with a bunch of stuff disabled. Oh, what? I guess we'll have some, some other cases too. Hmm. Is this going to be at all the same as, um, as what I'm already doing to split the menu? It is tempting to um, to lift a little bit of this up into BT common. There are some differences in what I'm doing though. Like I don't want to have this extra output frame, whereas that actually is useful in menu. segment DAB Yeah, so this one That's 3B1E Oh wait, 
this is tutorial. Let's, let's do one thing at a time. So like one way I could modify this is to have something that's like proc continue from, but also remembers that this is like a restart point or something like that, like a main restart point. And then anytime we exit from the continuation without a specific continue from, then, so it could be like a default continue from maybe. It could even just be a parameter that's like is default. I would need to go up here. Like it's tempting to extend this into an end level stack, but I don't actually want that. I do want this to be just two levels.
Yeah, this doesn't have to be complicated. So these are all going to be three byte call sites. Yeah, actually, this isn't going to be the length of the call site. I'm going to do the same thing I did um, on the other binary and use the extra address byte here to represent a call to the original, um, the original jump target. Let's see if that looks right on the tutorial. Um, Did I end up with a mix of tabs? I did. Mm, that looks right. Oh, that was supposed to have a default parameter. I might do something similar with my exec stack so that when, like I don't want to have just an unbounded stack, but maybe I'll just have like the current binary and the default binary or the default process. Okay. Oh yeah, that's still full of debug output. I should turn that off. Um, anyway, let's press escape. Oh, that's a good sign. To go back to the room, press enter. Oh, yeah. Huh. That was supposed to clear the screen. You know, I think I may have binary patched out a screen clear routine. Perhaps it's necessary here. Um, anyway, that would, pr I think, exit. There, yes, we exited. Yeah, let's see if we can get control flow working. Um, 
Let's just turn that full trace back off. Okay, so we can register process. Um, Oh, the auto reloader eventually restarted it. That's not helping. Okay, so we have a system whereby we can call exec and that'll search for a program and run it. Um, then we can register a process, which adds it to the spec. If it's default, We have this message up here for exec. I was tempted to call this exec. Um, maybe I should actually just for, like I could just go like p exec like that just to call the process. But just to give the code a little bit more test coverage, I might call the local exec here. it should not be an SBT process. Because I should rename hardware because it's not really about hardware anymore. It's more like a container. So it sets up the continuation to be this error, which is fine. Um, Almost like I want this to and maybe I want this to be responsible for telling hardware to go back to the default process. It's different than execing the default. I actually want to resume the default process.
call that resume default process. The plumbing here is a little bit weird. All right, there's the main menu, or at least what works of it so far. So you, you saw it go really quickly through the cutscenes because I'm not queuing up output frames yet. And now I don't know why I'm getting a black screen where I should be seeing the actual menu, but the cursor is there. So if I press space, I can get it to move the cursor or something. Can we go to the lap? Not quite. So, this error message would imply that it's still running the menu process after we should have called here. Um, It is nice seeing the little robot dude at the right aspect ratio.
way to go. Oh. Wow, that made it a lot further. So that actually did switch from menu. Um, or no, no it didn't. Sorry, no, that's the same binary. Uh, what does this even mean? Abort. Hmm. Okay, let's try Innovation Lab, which was this one. never happens because continue from halts through long jump yeah okay all right I should remember that this function does not return the auto reloader. Okay. Mm. Oh. Okay, that's different. Um, now we're having problems with parsing the command line or something like that. It could even just mean that all the registers are trash here. So we resumed the default process, we're back in play.exe, and then play.exe is going back into exec with a bad string. Any other behaviors we should know about? What does it do when we try to play the game via that same cutscene? Abort. Tutorial, maybe? I don't know if that was the tutorial. I don't think that was the tutorial. Seem right. I'm assuming this is in the data segment, is that correct? Mm. Like, it doesn't seem like it's completely broken, because this was... Well, have we seen any signs of life from this? Actually, yeah, I don't think we've ever seen this work correctly, so... It might just be completely wrong. Um, like, the cutscene is part of the same binary. This binary goes through a different exec path because it's the first one. So 
So these are all the call sites for this exec wrapper. Oh wait, yeah, no, never mind. This is the same exec wrapper that runs the menu itself. So, like this is where we were, which seems fine. Um, So for all these other locations, we should already have that NBX. Let's add some debugging here. to go. Oh yeah, there we go, there's the exact hook. Data segment is 8B, BX is 12. Cool. What about when I try to load the lab? 8B, BX, 1D. Huh. Oh, I guess I need to go re-decompress the data segment. Really? <sighs> I thought we were going to have this still in memory without anyone bothering it. Maybe that's the problem, though. Because we shouldn't have to reload the data segment. Like, we're not actually re-execing the binary. We're just expecting it to stay in memory. So maybe the problem is my memory map. Yeah, 1D is supposed to be menu.exe with a parameter of M. So re-entering the menu. Yeah, it's acting like the memory is getting overwritten by other stuff. Um, <sighs> Am I just aliasing too much memory?
to play. So play loads with data segment relocated to OX70, code segment to OX70. Data segment is actually 8B down here. Menu. I don't know who would be overriding that memory. It would be great to set a trace point on that. Hmm. Oh, is this the problem? this actually hard coded I thought we were getting a relocation ad address from each binary but this is definitely a problem I think DOS actually does this according to the memory allocation at the time. Um, I would like to do this statically though. I think part of why we're getting away with having less RAM, because like this originally ran on a machine with 256k of RAM and I'm only running it with 128k. Um, I think part of that is uh, doable because I don't have DOS or BIOS or even a real frame buffer. Um, but I think part of it might be because I was relocating to such a low address. I think I just want to set this up at translation time and just lay out my memory manually.
what these games already have a hint in the exe header that I can use for this. Does this not actually have the format? No. <sighs> so what I'm looking for is some hint as to what memory play and um, menu and all the rest actually want. It looks like play probably wants to be at some low memory that's below everything else. Yeah, so let's look at play. menu, menu 2, and game. Yeah, see, this is interesting. Um, I think we're just telling DOS not to really worry about memory allocation for most of these. Because menu, menu 2 and game have like one page or zero pages um, as the amount of memory requested. But then play is asking for 41 pages or paragraphs. And this is 16 bytes. This is 410 total. And that's the maximum allocation. Initial stack segment, which is actually the real stack we're using. We're just not using, like this is the number that we set the stack pointer to, but then the actual stack instructions don't really use it. So it's not really, really the stack, but it's kind of the stack. Checksum, instruction pointer, code segment. The code segments here don't seem like they would overlap anyway, but I think this is just because um, like the spot where plays code would end up, it just gets overwritten by the data for these if they ended up relocated to the same address. Yeah, anyway, I think I'm just going to allocate memory here manually. So relock segment. I 
actually kind of want this to be specified in all the instances. No, I need that when I'm parsing the header. I do actually have to override the constructor here. I don't really like the way these objects are composed. repetition. Well, I don't know. It doesn't let me change the argument list at all. if we can make progress.
Let's make the default C0. Or 100 maybe. Which is... Yeah. Oh, the question about Rust. Um, yeah, no, I, I switched back to using C++ for this. I, I had originally written this thing in C++ back in 2009, and um, I was thinking about using like Rust Standard Web or Rust um, like Wasm Bind Gen. Um, but there were a few reasons I decided to stick with C++. Um, I don't know that I want to get into all of them right now, but yeah, it, it seemed like um, I wasn't actually going to be writing much new code in Rust anyway, and it was just going to add um, additional headache versus just using something that was already mostly working. But like, for example, the way I implement control flow is entirely with go-tos. That wouldn't have been a good match for Rust. Um, I'm also using unions with different sized uh, data items, which I think um, C compilers are usually pretty good at dealing with, whereas in Rust I would have ended up rewriting a lot of that code. So it just seemed like this was a better match for the project, just using mscripten, and I can produce somewhat smaller web assemblies that way. Shaved off like 250 kilobytes, just because I was having trouble getting rid of all the library code. Um, in the Rust build. Not a problem with Rust itself, it's just that that, that build I was using um, would have required more work to optimize and it wasn't really a direction I wanted to go in and go in anyway. Address is going to be wrong now. <laughs> Can 
I get away with leaving these where they were and moving the other one earlier anyway. Where is the program segment prefix anyway? Because I really don't have much room here. It's really frustrating that these addresses are post relocation. the program segment prefix. Mm. How low can we go? Let's try 20. That's really close to the beginning of memory, but there might be enough room there for the interrupt vector table and the program segment prefix. I don't, I don't think there's enough room, but let's, let's try this. This was OX70. Like these are back to the addresses we were used to. Then there's this problem. Is that really about the relocation segment? Like, let's go back to 70. That works at 70. Oh, oh, right, because these are, yeah. Okay, that disassembled. So now this is going to end up expanding to 200 in memory. Just a little thing, just like this could be a .com file with just like all the code and data in a single segment. Let's see if that runs.
we're in the menu again. Try to go to the lab. Huh. Oh, I think this is, is that actually not going to the lab because it's switching disks. So it was asking you to put in disk two and it runs menu, which I think is trying to run the version of menu on disk two. Huh. And it's kind of hard to tell what we're doing because the menu keeps losing its screen. So it was running menu M again. Let's try running the main game. No, that was the lab. This is the game. Cutscene and then abort. Yeah. Abort three this time. Yeah, I don't know why we're getting an abort here. Build with s assertions equals one. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to work on this all day, so maybe this is a good stopping point because I wanted to at least try some of the control flow rewriting. Um, and it looks like some of that's working, but maybe we're running into other problems too, um, related to just memory management and whatever else is going on here. Um, it seems like we're no longer having problems related to the binaries just stomping on each other, which is nice, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I just moved that play.exe like way into low memory and I'm not quite sure that that's an okay place to put it because I think that's usually like where DOS itself lives and, um, which is fine, but um, like, I don't know. I, I should actually go through and check a memory map on this and see if everything is cool. Um, Cause so far I've been just placing things where it seems good at the time without like a really well thought out plan. So yeah, if I reload this right here, then the menu does some things. Uh, what about loading a game? Does that work? I would expect this to run game.exe with a parameter of 99 to get it to open the load menu. That is not what it did. It's also possible my control flow hacks for this modal have completely broken things. Hmm. Uh, now it's like build with assertions equals two for more info. Oh, invalid function pointer called. Null funk v. Um, where would I actually have a null function pointer? I try assertions equal to.
I don't know if this bottom line of the screen is supposed to be white like that. So, intro very quickly, and then Let's try compiling this. Um, so, dash OZ is severe size optimization, whereas dash G4 is debug and it'll be huge. So let's switch to that. Okay, so this is a null function, a null pointer. Somebody called it with a single value parameter. And we've got wasm function numbers here. Does, does Chrome not know how to open the debug symbols? Seems likely Chrome doesn't know about the debug symbols. Let's try obstump. Oh, I think I should try this with not the... I don't actually know where the run serve is storing the .wasm. It's probably in cache somewhere, but just to make it easier to find the exact binary I'm dealing with, I'm gonna clean out my dist directory and do a npm run build and then serve it from there. Thomas is wondering why I can't just make a giant array and not worry about where I put things in there. I mean, I could, but I would prefer not to just waste huge amounts of memory. So, I mean, while I could just say like, yes, this binary gets 128K and this binary gets 128K, like that is way more than they need. Like they need like a kilobyte maybe. So like right now it's kind of, I'm just, putting stuff in place. I mean, right now I'm, I'm allocating 128K for this machine and that's already way more than I need. So I, I guess I'm not really sure what you're asking. Like, yes, I can make a machine that wastes even more memory, but the thing that I was just asking was like, how can I be more careful about my memory so that I actually know what's being used for what? Because one other thing that I like to be able to do with this is like to not just assume that I have one instance of the game, but to be able to have multiple, um, you know, multiple memory buffers if I need to. So for example, let's say you're playing and you want to open a save game file. I could just spin up another instance of the game really, really easily and use that to preview the save game. And, um, you know, and it would be nice if that involved allocating like 100k of memory and not like several megabytes of memory, so. Oh, you thought that the relocations and crashes were relating to it running out of memory? No, we're not running out of memory, it's just that... This isn't about amount, it's about how it's being used. So, while I could just... I guess I still don't know what you're asking. Sorry. Um... 
Like there are maybe some problems you could solve just by indiscriminately throwing completely fresh blocks of memory at them, but I don't necessarily see a bunch of those. Um, I could completely reinitialize the state of my virtual memory when jumping back into the play binary. That's what I was saying, like I could re-decompress the data segment, but I don't want to do that since I don't actually want to lose the state of that program. I want all of its local and global variables, if possible, to stay put. Oh, that's funny. It's offering to have a name demangling support built in. That's cool. Oh, that's neat. So I, I have symbols here. They're just kind of confusing. <sighs> this is acting a lot like my continuation function is null. I don't know what this B35 thing is. I think that might be an automatically generated shim for the invocation. Um, this is the last code I recognize, and this is SBT process run, which does call into a function pointer, which might be trashed. This is still in menu, right? Menu.exe. I don't know if this assert is working. It looks like this function pointer was zero, but I don't know what this zero actually means here.
fixing my debug slightly, but it's kind of working. Hmm. I don't know why those function pointers already seem to have different values from save versus enter. This is entering again without saving, which could mean we're re-entering, but it probably means that this is the default function. Oh, are we not setting a default value for the default function? That's probably what's going on. Yeah, never mind. This, this might be a symptom of some other control flow issue because I don't think we should be exiting through this path, but uh, the null pointer call is definitely a problem. Yeah, I think that's a control flow problem in the cutscene. Because I think we're effectively just re-entering menu instead of exiting menu. Like, I think there's an exit that we're actually not continuing to. Those are the delays, and then these are the um, kind of keyboard pulling loops.
Okay, we're picking a cutscene. There's the main menu. Here's where we're checking for the keys O or enter, I think. So we're going to end up returning through this path, setting exit code to something. Did we not make it down there for some reason? I'm going to have to turn tracing back on. Does run a little slower when we're tracing. Whoa, why did we reload? Tell if it's got keyboard hookers or anything. There we go. Anything useful in there? Oh, why did they make it so hard to grab scroll bars these days? It's like, scroll bars, the least fits law compliant UI element, now made even smaller. Yeah, I'm gonna have to store this somewhere else to debug it properly. All right, well, I think that'll be my, my stopping point for today. Um, let's turn the stack trace off, but then at least set this default function thing so we don't get a null pointer and check that in. Um, and I can properly debug this some other time. 
hope that was kind of interesting. I, I find this project pretty fun. It's a nice thing to do when I want to procrastinate the video editing, but I should get back to video editing. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, thanks for folks uh, sticking around and hanging out and sharing content with your friends. And special thanks to everyone who supports me on Patreon and makes this stuff possible. And we'll try to get back to some electronic streaming soon, but I thought it was nice to actually do some software that wasn't super monotonous. Because I feel like a lot of the software um, that I do just to get the rest of these projects up and running turns out to be pretty kind of in the weeds all the time. Whereas, I mean, this has a lot of that too, but at least here we're making a game that has some interesting graphics and gameplay alongside it. So it isn't just all programming puzzles and nothing but programming puzzles. So, yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll see you next time. Here, have a, have a little bit of cat before we go.